Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk on this Communion Sunday. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening to the Dial a Sermon service. One or two family news items. The Duncan Morrow Prayer Group meets fortnightly and the next meeting is Sunday the 10th. That's next Sunday uh, at 10.15. The All Cut Lunches begin again on Tuesday at 12 noon with Judy Robertson's team uh, in charge. Also this afternoon we have our um, organ anniversary recital um, when we have Tiffany Vong, the um, organist at Jordan Hill Parish Church is coming to play. Uh, that's three o'clock here in the church and I would encourage as many people as possible to come along and to uh, listen to Tiffany playing. Alan heard her during the week and said she's absolutely wonderful. So it'll be well worth coming along and hearing her. And just finally, we've still got some spaces for next Saturday for Doors Open Day. If you can spare an hour, can you please put your name on the list so that um, we can have a full team um, for the Open Doors Day. The rest of the intimations you can read at your leisure. We're going to sit quietly for a moment or two as we remember the folks in Ukraine. Thank you. I'm not sure whether that was a good idea to have a Rangers man light a candle when we've got the old firm game this afternoon. <laughs> As I said, 50 years ago, the organ was replaced in the church in 1973 when renovations were made to the chancel area. And it's provided, presided over many services and occasions and our praise and worship would be much the poorer without it and the talented and dedicated organists who have played it for the past half century. And I suspect we've taken it and the musicians who have graced its keys for granted all too often, but not today. Today, we thank God for the skills of the organ builder and the organ players, without whom our praise would have fallen short of the ears of God himself. So let's just rededicate our organ, let's pray. Heavenly Father, your gift of free grace puts a new song in our mouth. We praise you that through music we can express something of the glory we have seen, the victory we share, and the joy we know. Bless your people as they sing, that our offering of praise and prayer is enriched by the music of our organ, so the Holy Spirit may always be present to breathe upon us, lifting our song into the worship of heaven. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's worship God as we sing our opening hymn, Praise to the Lord.
Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord of all, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer, that for all your greatness and wonder and holiness, we can speak with you as to a friend. We thank you that we can open our hearts to you, that we can pour out our innermost souls and share our deepest thoughts in the knowledge that you are there, always ready to listen and to understand. So now once more we lay our lives before you, open to your gaze, the bad as well as the good, the doubts as well as the faith, the sorrow as well as the joy, the despair as well as the hope. We bring the anger as well as the peace, the hatred as well as the love, the confusion as well as the certainty, the fear as well as the trust. Gracious God, we bring these not with pride or any sense of arrogance, but honestly recognizing that you know us through and through. Help us to be truthful to ourselves and truthful to you. And so may we discover the renewing love which only you can offer, a love that frees us to live as you would have us live and allows us to the people you would have us be. And hear us now as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I'd like to invite Anne Maxwell to read our lesson. Right, the first reading this morning is from Genesis, right at the beginning, isn't it? Genesis 1, verses 1 to 19. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered the waters gathered what he called seas, and God saw that it was good. <coughs> then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and have I read that already? according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons, and days, and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky 
to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. We sing 162 from Mission Praise, From Heaven You Came. The second reading is from Psalm 22, verses 1 to 11. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and I am not silent, and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. 
they cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, yet the Lord, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. The Lord bless to us these readings from his holy word, and to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. Thank you, Anne. We sing, "'Twas on that night."
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I said, today is all about celebrating the anniversary of our church organ, which makes it a little bit strange that the least musical member of the congregation is going to attempt to talk about the importance of music to our faith, David Lecky. <laughs> As you know, I am not musical in the least, but that doesn't mean that I do not appreciate the role, the role that music plays, not only in our services, but in our relationship with God as well. Here's a question. What do you get if you throw an organ down a mine shaft? A flat miner. What do you get if you drop an organ on an army base? Flat major. Did you hear about the organ player who played in tune? Neither did I. <laughs> they laughed at that, Alan. That's terrible. And what's the definition of an optimist? An organ player with a mortgage. Do you know how hard it was to find new organist jokes? <laughs> Today we're celebrating half a century of music from our organ. And music has always played a huge role in the Christian faith and before. You only have to read the Bible to see the centrality of music. Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the story, starts with a hymn. The story of creation is given to us in musical form, with each day being covered in a verse, and the verses separated by the chorus, and there was evening and there was morning. What better way to try and teach people about the beginning of the world than by writing a song that they could sing to themselves? But music wasn't just used to teach. It was also used to give thanks to God for his goodness. Miriam begins to sing to the glory of God after the people have been freed from Egypt and Pharaoh's army. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. And it isn't just in the Old Testament that music plays such a central role. In the New Testament, we find Peter and Silas in prison for healing the girl with the demonic spirit. And instead of despairing and feeling sorry for themselves, they began to sing praises to God, which not only led to them escaping from prison, it also led to the jailer and his family becoming Christians. Giving thanks to God, no matter your circumstances, can be a powerful testimony. A group of Russian Christians were meeting every week to pray for an opportunity where they could witness to the love and goodness of God. But they could not see how this would be possible as Christianity was banned at the time. And then after many weeks of praying, their meeting house was raided by the secret police and they were all arrested and taken to the police station. But as there were so many of them, they had to walk through the town under escort. To raise their spirits, they began to sing hymns, just as the local cinema began to empty. Their prayers were answered. And they had the opportunity to share the love and hope of God to hundreds of men and women. Never underestimate the power of music. Of course, the big, biggest book in the Bible in terms of chapters is the book of Psalms with over 150 different songs recorded. And many of the Psalms contain references to King David and to other biblical figures, including Asaph, the sons of Korah, and Solomon. Now, David's authorship is not accepted by most modern biblical scholars. They instead attribute the composition of the Psalms to various authors, writing between the 9th and 5th centuries BC. The Psalms were written from the time of the Israelite conquest of Canaan under Joshua to the post-exilic period, which is after the conquest of Babylon, Babylon, the Babylonians and the Persians. And the was probably compiled and edited into its present form during the period of the 5th century BC. Now, it can be broken down into five sections ending at chapters 42, 73, 90, 107, and of course, 150. So the book covers a timescale of almost half a millennium. 
and is written by people from all walks of life, facing all sorts of situations. And the book not only teaches us about the importance and centrality of music and singing to our faith, it also teaches us that there is no subject on earth that cannot be sung about. If you wanted one word to sum up the contents of the book of Psalms, then that word is honesty. You can find a psalm to match every emotion, emotion known to mankind. The writers of the psalms were not known for being backwards at coming forwards. In the very first psalm, the author makes it perfectly clear that if we want to have a fulfilled and content life, then God has to be at the very center of it. Blessed is the person who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. If ever you are looking for guidance on how to build your life, or wondering about what you must do to make God pleased, then you need go no further than the book of Psalms to find it. Maybe you're going through a time of trial, and you don't know where to turn, who to rely on. Things seem to be getting on top of you, and you cannot see a way out. Well, Psalm 27 reminds us of where to look. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Psalm 27 reminds us that everybody who has ever turned to God for refuge and sanctuary has never been refused or let down. Now both these psalms remind us of the goodness and the faithfulness of God and how he can and always does come to our rescue. And I suspect that many of these psalms were written after the events and are a reflection of what happened. For example, Psalm 23 was written by David after his son had rebelled against him. But only when the rebellion had been quelled did David put pen to paper and memorialize the event in song. But some of the Psalms were written while people were enduring terrible hardship or pain. And they show us an honesty that we sometimes find it hard to accept today. Anne read from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. These are the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And they were spoken with great passion and feeling. This is no passive cry. This is a gut-wrenching howl of utter desolation and isolation. At this moment in time, Jesus is totally and utterly alone, facing his imminent death, and he lets rip. He tells God exactly how he feels, even if in fact he is wrong and God hasn't abandoned him. That is how Jesus feels. The author of Psalm 22 understood what Jesus was going through in his situation. And he wasn't afraid of letting God know how he felt. And the same is true of Psalm 37, where mothers are weeping because their children have been murdered by the invaders. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. The writer did not hold back on what he wanted to say to God. They desired cold-blooded vengeance. And they didn't care that that might not be how God wanted them to feel. They were honest with him. And God is okay with that. 
And that's the point of Psalms, like 22 and 37. God doesn't want us to be polite or correct when we are in pain. He wants to know what it is that we are going through. Because only then can he enfold his arms around us and take our pain away. God requires honesty from us. And the Psalms tell us that. And also that no matter how angry we might feel towards God, he will never hold that against us. He will always be there, arms open wide, waiting to receive us. And the book ends with a psalm of celebration. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding trumpet. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Let praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In other words, we are being told that if we put our trust in God, Psalm 1, and if we rely on his power and authority, Psalm 27, and if we are honest with God, Psalm 22 and 137, then in the end, God will make all things right, as he did with Jesus on the cross. And we will be able to sing God's praises once more. Music and song are the glue that hold our faith together. And the book of Psalms is where we can find that encouragement, inspiration, challenge and solace to help us through, no matter what the world might throw at us. So let's give thanks to God for the gifts of music and song, and especially for those who bring them to life for us Sunday by Sunday, through the organ or the piano or whatever instrument they might play. Praise the Lord. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these thoughts, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Let's worship God with our offering. Father God, day by day you bless us, and today we bring some of that blessing back to you, asking that you would accept it and bless it and use it, that your kingdom might grow. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I ask the elders who are going to serve communion to come forward? Please be seated. In John's Gospel, there is a story telling us that Jesus went into Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. And he came to the sheep pool, where among the columns there lay a crowd of handicapped people. Some lame, some blind, some crippled. And among them was a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. When Jesus saw the man lying there, he asked him a seemingly strange question. Do you want to recover? The man said, I've got no one to put me into the pool when the water is disturbed. And while I am moving, someone gets there before me. Jesus said, rise up to your feet, take your bed and walk. Many of us are here today because we want to recover from past guilt, mistakes and failures that have haunted us for many years. Or from a sense of inadequacy that has left us lacking in self-confidence. Or from an acute loss of faith that has led us to doubt everything and to believe nothing. 
or from a hard personal experience like bereavement that has made us cold, numb and insecure. Many of us here today are here because we want to recover our strength, our sense of moral balance, to regain a proper understanding of human relationships and to rediscover a true perspective on life's meaning and purpose. To all of us, Jesus extends an invitation to rise up and to walk with him and in his company find the strength and the confidence to be the whole integrated faithful people God means us to be and so be able to live as God intends us to live. We come not because we are strong but because we are weak. Not because of any goodness of our own gives us the right to come but because we need mercy and help. We come because we love God a little and would like to love him more. We come because he loves us and gave himself for us. This is the Lord's table. Jesus said, come to me all whose work is hard, whose load is heavy, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. I will never turn anyone away who comes to me. We will remain seated as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful Father, out of the fullness of your gifts, we offer you this bread and this cup. By the blood of your dear Son, you have opened up for us a new and living way into your presence. Help us in faith to enter with Jesus and grant that being pure in heart through grace, we may share in his immortal sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, listen to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by St. Paul. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, I take these elements of bread and wine to be set apart from all common use to this holy use and mystery. And as he gave thanks and blessed, let us draw near to God and present to him our prayers and our thanksgivings. Let us pray. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, we acknowledge you to be Lord of all, and at all times we honour your greatness and glory. Firstly, because you created us in your own image and likeness, but chiefly because you freed us from the enslavement of sin through Jesus. You gave him in love to be made man, like us in all things except sin, that by his death and resurrection he might bring again life to the world. Lord, we are not able in our dullness to understand the breadth and length and height and depth of your love. But true to the commandment of Jesus, we come to this table which he has left to us to be used in remembrance of his death until he comes again. Here we declare and witness before the world that through Christ alone we have received liberty and life. You have claimed us as children and heirs. You have freely bestowed your grace upon us and you have raised us into your spiritual kingdom, there to eat and drink with you at that most joyful of tables, eternal life. In this present time, 
we on earth have communion with you in heaven. But in that time to come, we shall be raised to that endless joy, prepared for us before the foundation of the world was laid. We acknowledge that we have received these wonderful gifts by your free mercy and grace through your only Son, Jesus. And moved by your Holy Spirit, we, your people, give you all thanks, praise, and glory forever and ever. Amen. According to the holy institution of our Lord Jesus Christ, and for a memorial of him we do this, who on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had blessed and given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. This do as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, grant us your peace. Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant sealed with my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. prayers for other people, let us pray. Lord our Father, we welcome you into this your holy place, and we praise you, creator of this world and ruler over all. Forgive us, we pray, that we do not always express in deed and action that which we express in words. So in this special time of worship, when we communion we commune with you through the sharing of bread and wine. May we also reaffirm our faith in you and all your works. So help us, God. Lord, in the midst of storms, raging fires, and the murder of innocent children, may we burn with righteous anger and compassion. Where children are hungry, sick, with no clean water, and no access to medical care, May we give of ourselves and money till it hurts. Where there is fear, oppression and bondage, may we fight for change. Where there is greed, selfishness and injustice, may our voices be heard. Where there is too much loss of life in the fight for freedom, may we stand alongside. Where we condone suffering or turn a blind eye, may we be rightfully judged. Living God, we see the devastation we have caused to your beautiful world. We must make change, so help us, God. Change our apathy to urgency. Change our fearfulness to bravery. Change our silence into words of freedom. Change our hatred of one another into loving kindness. Change each one of us, your servants, Lord, into the people you would wish us to be. Without you, we cannot, and without us, you will not. Merciful Father, hear our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. Just before we sing our closing hymn, can I remind you that um, we still need some volunteers for the Doors Open Day and also of the organ recital this afternoon, three o'clock in the church. We close by singing in Christ alone.
now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore.